Uh, my name is Stephen Thomas, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, BizTalk 2013 and Windows Azure Infrastructure as a Service. So let's get started with a little bit about me. Um, I'm a 10-year integration MVP, which now means at Microsoft you get this cool little 10-year disk mailed to you. Um, they finally got smart. Instead of sending you an award every year, they just send you a new disk to add to your existing award, so I, I guess that's cool. Um, I also run the community site biztalkgurus.com, which is always cool when I'm here with Guru from Microsoft. <laughs> I really like to rub in the fact that I own that domain, I own the .org, I own the singular for biztalkguru.com, so I pretty much got it all covered. But a new addition is I got biztalk.guru. So I've got it all covered, there's nothing he's going to be able to get. <laughs> Uh, I also, uh, along with Richard, I co-authored the uh, book Applied Arch Architecture Patterns on the Microsoft Platform. I'm um, really proud of it as well. Um, yeah, I think it's a good book. I was happy to see a lot of people in here have read it. Um, I'm also a Pluralsight author. My first course was called What's New in BizTalk 2013. Uh, my new course that I'm working on now is featuring that uncle that nobody talks about. It's Introduction to the ESB Server Toolkit. Uh, so everyone that's misunderstood about it can come on a plural site and look at my course. Um, it, it should be good, I hope. Um, I've pr presented at numerous events over the past 12 years. Um, is there anybody here that's seen me present before? Awesome, so people have seen me and chose to come back and see me again. <laughs> so I'm always excited. Um, when nobody raises their hand, then I'm scared everyone's left because they didn't want to see me again. Um, <coughs> another thing to point out is I'm one of the world's worst spellers. So, Back home in the States, they have standardized testing. I got a 7 percentile in spelling in, my, in, uh, in the standardized test. So that means out of every 100 people, six people are worse than me at spelling. <laughs> so keep that in mind. That means 12 people in here are worse than me at spelling. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and, uh, of course, email me anytime. I have a very simple email address. It's simply me at biztalkaguru.com. <laughs> So it comes right to me. You can add an S on there too. I'll, I get them both ways. So, so I'm taking a huge risk coming here today. So I left my wife at home with our two-week-old baby daughter. And I know. So I know. So obviously it's great, you know, to be here and present to everybody. That's going to be one of my rewards. But my real re reward is last night I slept six hours straight. <laughs> And, uh, oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> okay, so let's do an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, first off, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, common infrastructure pain points um, that I think we we'll probably all see um, in, our, in our jobs today. Then I'm going to come and talk about some of the basics of infrastructure as a service. And we can see how what Microsoft is offering can help solve some of those pain points. And last, we're going to look at how we can use BizTalk 2013 and infrastructure as a service to help us uh, deliver solutions quicker and that meet our goals. So first off, is there anybody in here that considers themselves an infrastructure person? Oh, fantastic. Okay, so our first pain point, which is really why we don't really get along with infrastructure people. <laughs> so, us as developers, I think we're all probably fall in this bucket, we're control freaks. So we want as much control over what we're doing as possible. In general, the infrastructure is usually out of our control. Even in a dev, uh, dev scenario, we usually have to request a virtual machine. We don't have to actually go out and build it ourselves. So there's a plus and minus for, to that. We don't have to build it, but at the same time, we have to depend on another team or another, another resources to do that for us. So when we do this, it makes us ask uh, certain questions. Well, first off, why does it take so long? Next, is it really that hard? for people to come up and deliver us a, you know, new infrastructure when we ask for it. Um, why do I need to open a ticket? I just want somebody added to a, a specific group and I have to open up a ticket and we have to wait a couple days, it has to get approved. And the whole process just takes a while. And then, what do you mean, mean you erase my virtual machine? I've been on multiple clients, VMs just disappear, disks disappear, and then you have to go open another ticket to get your virtual machine back again. Uh, and then last, why am I not in the SSO admin group? So now, again, I have to open up another ticket, get added to that SSO admin group. So along with that, some of the common pain points that I see is resource onboarding. So we start up a new project. We're going to bring on 10 new individuals. Well, 
that process to onboard them can be slow. Sometimes it can take a day or two. I've seen it take up to two weeks. I saw a project where they onboarded 20 resources and they had to sit there idle for two weeks doing documentation because they didn't have virtual machines ready for these resources uh, to get started. Um, there's also out of space. So you bring on new resources. Sometimes it's, you're out of disk space. You're out of uh, server capacity to actually deliver new virtual machines to them. Um, there's also the added support costs and added internal costs for adding new uh, virtual machines uh, in your organization. Uh, another common pain point is when you want to do an upgrade. So let's say we want to move from BizTalk 2010 to BizTalk 2013. Well, at some point, you're going to want those environments to coexist. You don't want to turn off your 2010 environment and upgrade to 2013 in the event that you might need to roll back and try some new changes there. Um, I've been at a few clients that have the extra capacity on a hardware perspective to actually support multiple environments during an upgrade. Um, next is when we have multi-server environments. Um, there's a lot of times, particularly when you're testing new deployment uh, packages, where having a multi-server environment is very beneficial, <coughs> um, even at the dev level. To be able to test something going to two servers is definitely more challenging and more valuable than testing something just in your local dev box. <coughs> Uh, la uh, next is solutions that have a short lifespan. Uh, believe it or not, some solutions don't intend to live forever. Um, I've seen scenarios where new, new um, co companies were purchased and clients were going to merge computer systems, and they want to keep these old systems around for six months, so they need a, a BizTalk integration solution to support a smaller amount uh, time window than infinity, essentially, or several years down the road. Um, the current IT infrastructures that I've seen just really aren't built to support a short-term uh, short based solution. And also handling the bursting scenarios, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, the Boxing Day scenarios, any time where you're going to go from a small amount of messages to 100 times your, your volume in a short amount of time. So after we've covered some of the pain points that we've seen on the infrastructure side, um, let's spend a few minutes and see how Windows Infrastructure as a Service can help us solve some of these pain points. So what is Infrastructure as a Service? So it's Microsoft's pay-per-use offering, which delivers infrastructure when you need it at a pay-per-minute or yeah, actually now it's per-minute billing cycle. Uh, there's two key components to the Infrastructure as a Service. There's the virtual machines, which is what we're going to focus on here, and then there's the virtual networking side of things. Now, the virtual networking side of things, you can take it to many different levels. They actually now have a way where you can VPN into your virtual networks, and you, you could even create site-to-site -site connecti connectivity between your on-premise uh, network and Windows Azure. There's a rich and growing list of pre-built images available for us inside the Windows Azure portal. Um, this is important because these images are maintained by Microsoft. So as New patches are added and systems are upgraded. Uh, new uh, BizTalk uh, 2013 R2 beta comes out. They'll be able to provide us pre-built images so we can really just fire up that virtual machine and get playing with this new stuff right away. Uh, if we don't like their pre-built images or they happen to take one away, like they did with BizTalk 2013 evaluation, uh, we can create our own custom images. And we can also create our own pre-built disks that we can then clone and use again and again and again if we like the features that we have built up on those disks. They also have uh, new, as of a few months ago, I guess six months ago now, the pay per minute pricing. So before it was at hour increments, but now if you want to <coughs> spin something up for like seven and a half minutes, you're going to be charged for eight minutes of billing on that, which is nice. And they also offer MSDN discounts. So I think the virtual machines are discounted at 35% uh, off the base rate. And in addition to that, all the premium Disks. So if you spin up uh, BizTalk 2013 Enterprise Edition, that's all charged at with no premium for your MSDN account. Um, you just need to make sure you actually create those virtual machines under your MSDN subscription. Otherwise, you're going to be charged at, at the higher rate, which is 4 or $5 an hour for that. Uh, and the key thing that I see infrastructure as a service delivering to us is it allows us for programmatically creating new environments. And that's really what we're going to spend uh, most of the time talking about here, is how can we programmatically create these environments and use them again and again and again, tear them down and create them fresh every day, so that we know that we're always dealing with something that's, that hasn't been corrupted. So let's take a look at inside a Windows Azure virtual machine. So all the virtual machines actually live inside of a service. 
So services have been around since the creation of Windows Azure. It's kind of the first thing that kind of went live. <laughs> so now as they added these virtual machines to their offering, they actually create the virtual machines inside a service. Now you can have more than one virtual machine inside a service, and that you would do that for uh, scalability purposes, but that's a little bit outside of what we want to talk about here. Uh, our focus here is more on a dev test scenario. Um, so we have the service, and we have the virtual machines that exist inside there. We have one operating system disk, which is always going to be your C drive. And then you can have zero to N data disks. Now the amount of data disks you have depend, or can have depend on the size of virtual machine you select. You don't have to have any data disks, but you can add them if you need to. So some quick tips. So related to disks, so why would I want a data disk or more than one data disk? Um, each data disk is going to give you about 500 IOPS, uh, input, output, transfer on that disk. Uh, if you need, if you have throughput problems, you can scale out by adding more data disks and spanning across those disks. Uh, that won't necessarily pertain in a dev test scenario, but if you're looking at building out like a production SQL server on virtual machines, how you span and create your disks is very important. Um, each disk is also limited to one terabyte, um, so you want to keep that in mind if you're going to have databases that are going to grow large. But kind of outside of the scope of, of what we would use BizTalk and virtual machines for. Um, something else that I found out by listening to one of the Pluralsight courses on you know, building out SQL uh, production instances in uh, Azure is that geo-replicated disks can get out of sync. So when you create your storage account, you have that little check box where you can say geo-replicate this storage account. And when you select that and actually create a VHD inside that storage account, you get geo-replication of that data, but it can get out of sync. So if you lost that data center, there could be a small amount of data that hasn't been copied yet to your geo-replicated uh, store. So actually, <laughs> his recommendation for SQL was not to use geo-replication for your uh, VHDs, which you know, to me makes sense, and definitely in a dev test scenario, you wouldn't need that. Uh, another thing to note is on the data disks and OS disks, you're only charged for the actual amount of space you use. So if you have a 127 gigabyte disk, you're only charged for the amount of space that you actually <coughs> consume on that disk. Now, they implemented something new called file level shrink. So if you have 10 one gigabyte files and delete five of them, they're now gonna only charge you for five gig gigabytes of space on there. But if you have 10 files that are one gigabyte each and you made them all one meg, they're still gonna charge you for the 10 gigabytes. So they do their shrink at the file level, not at the content of that file. Um, I think that's going to be changing soon, they've mentioned, but for now, kind of keep that in mind. Uh, another thing to point out is to always use quick format when you're adding a data disk. If you do full format, it writes zeros to the whole disk, and then you end up starting to get charged for that whole disk, because now it's full of data. Um, I didn't know that, but that, that was very useful. Uh, so some quick tips on virtual machines. Um, you're going to want to plan in advance when you're going to create your virtual machines and your virtual networks. Um, over time, they've been getting a lot better about what they expose to you in the portal and what they allow you to change. But it's possible that sometimes after you create something, you're not actually able to change it later. So there's certain things on virtual networks, like creating a VPN and stuff like that, that you have to remove everybody from using that network before you can make changes to it. So it's just always easier to plan in advance on what you want to do with what you're actually building out. Um, the other thing to note is that sometimes new features aren't always available to the existing objects. Um, I have this problem a lot uh, more when infrastructure as a service was in preview, that when they added new features and you know, changed caching models on the disks, that I wasn't able to apply those to my existing objects. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that if they roll out a new feature, you're trying to implement it and it doesn't work, well, every once in a while you have to create a new object to, to get that to work. So this might sound too good to be true. Uh, so let's talk about some of the challenges we face when we try to implement uh, infrastructure as a service. Uh, I think we talked earlier, Guru mentioned how they have 313 release cycles. Uh, things in Windows Azure change frequently. Core features are added, preview features are added, other preview features just seem to quietly go away. Uh, the documentation and notification on this from what I've seen is either poor or non-existent. So if you go off for holiday in the summer, you could come back and not even recognize the portal anymore. Um, that's really to the level that they kind of take things. Generally, it's adding new features, but at the same time, you've got to remember if you're writing PowerShell scripts against this, they change the underlying PowerShell, 
Well, I've spent the past two weeks updating PowerShell scripts that worked fine seven months ago. Um, so that was because things drastically changed since then. They added new support for removing things a lot easier. Um, so generally, the changes are for the good. But you just want to keep in mind that you just can't build something and then forget about it. You're going to have to constantly keep in touch with kind of how things are going on the Windows Azure side. Um, and I think that's kind of different for us from working on premise so long where you have a very fine con control about when things change. We have to kind of shift our mindset to think that now Microsoft is controlling this and they're going to change things and make things better, roll out new features so they can make more money. Once we think about that, then it's hopefully a little easier for us to remember that we have to keep, keep tabs on this. Uh, when you do hit a limitation, that limitation is generally going to be a hard limitation. Um, unless you're a huge client, you can't really call it Microsoft and say, I don't like the way something works, I want you to change it. So you'll have to either develop a workaround or uh, you know, not be able to use Windows Azure for what you're trying to use it for. Uh, the other problem I've ran into is related to object latency. So I'll go in and delete a virtual machine, and sometimes that virtual machine deletes in three minutes, sometimes it deletes in 30 minutes, sometimes it sits there and spins for another two hours. Um, it's a little unpredictable on some of that stuff, um, so that's another thing you want to keep in mind is that just because you've told it to create something doesn't mean it actually gets created in the time span that you would expect it to. So with that, let's talk about how we can use BizTalk 2013 <coughs> with infrastructure as a service. Um, is there anybody today using <coughs> infrastructure as a service for Microsoft? Okay, one or two people. Um, has anybody taken a look at the past scripts I released, the PowerShell scripts that create BizTalk? Okay, one or two people. Um, I like to title this section, to Us Taking Back Control. Um, it's bringing the dev environment back into something that we can control. Um, this isn't going to work for every enterprise, and it isn't going to work for every client. Um, I know I, for one, even if the client provides me a virtual machine to use on their network, I have my own virtual machine running in Azure that I do my own testing and trials and various things on. Um, obviously, you've got to make sure you don't copy anything that's sensitive onto your virtual machine, uh, but it definitely does supplement the machine that they give me. Um, I definitely don't want to have to call them up and say, yeah, I destroyed BizTalk on this environment, I need you to you know, recreate my virtual machine. So I try to do more risky things on my virtual machines. <coughs> so what makes uh, infrastructure as a service special for BizTalk 2013? Uh, so they provide us some pre-built images, like we uh, talked about before, which is really useful. So they provided a standard edition and an enterprise edition, which are fully installed with BizTalk. All you need to do is add the SQL Server, configure it, and you can be up and running. Now, with these, they've introduced a new pay-per-minute billing cycle, which gives you a fully <coughs> licensed BizTalk environment for that time span that you spin it up. So what this means is, if I want a new BizTalk server to serve extra capacity for the day after Thanksgiving, <coughs> only for that 24 hours, I can now do that in Windows Azure and pay per minute or hour for that uh, BizTalk server. If I want something longer term running in Azure, I can bring my own license and put my licenses up there, create my own disk, install my own copy of BizTalk, and be up and running with that uh, if I choose, choose to go that route. Uh, if you go that route, then you only have to pay for the base virtual machine that you're running. <coughs> They've also introduced a new tool called the BizTalk provisioning tool. Uh, this is installed on the C drive for all the new images that you create off of uh, Windows Azure. And this is really intended to help automate multi-server BizTalk configuration. So what they do is they provide you a service that needs to run on every BizTalk server in your group. And they provide you a client that needs to run on one of the BizTalk boxes. And you pass in a special configuration file to help automate your multi the configuration of your multi-server BizTalk environment. So it's much simpler than the as-is BizTalk configuration files that we'll export out of BizTalk admin today. It's actually very uh, user-friendly and very readable. Uh, so they've made great leaps and bounds to try to make multi-server configuration simple. <laughs> the downside is I still can't get it to run unattended. So what I've been spending the vast majority of my time on is getting an, a script that you can run and come back in 60 minutes and have a fully configured working multi-server BizTalk environment on its own isolated domain. I'm really, really close to it but I haven't got the unattended configuration 100% worked out yet. 
<coughs> so let's talk about what my dream scenario is. Now, everyone probably has different dreams than I do. Hopefully, you have different dreams, better dreams, actually. Because um, I dream about how I want this talk to run in the cloud. It's not exciting. Uh, so in my mind, I want to have more, if not total, control over the environment. And I want to say that this is only in dev and test scenarios. I still want absolutely nothing to do with the production environments. I don't want Tor coming after me. So we'll leave that to the BizTalk admins and the infrastructure as it should be. But if I want a dev box to test a multi-server deployment scenario, I shouldn't have to wait three weeks to get that done. If I want to try a new HIPAA schema, because they've released Cumulative Update 4 that has a new schema for me, I don't want to have to wait three weeks for the boss who's on vacation to approve that request. <coughs> I should have to fire up a virtual machine, install it, and two hours later know for sure whether or not I can use that update or not. I want something that's automated so that I can just click it and run and let it do its thing. I want something that's self-service so that I don't have to open a support ticket, I don't have to call people. I want something that's going to be able that I can do and get something done with it. I want something that's repeatable. I don't want something that's going to work today and necessarily break tomorrow. I also want something that's secure because just because I can create something, I don't necessarily want the junior developer to come in, spin up 10 BizTalk domains, and let's get a huge bill at the end of it. I think somebody in here had that experience um, uh, where there, somebody accidentally left on an Enterprise SQL edition for a, a whole month, and, and it's a little hard to track that kind of thing uh, currently in Azure. So we have lots of options to help us reach whatever our dream scenario is. Uh, the main one, or the three main ones, is the portal. We have the REST API, and then we have PowerShell scripts. So we're going to take a look at each of these and how we can use them to build out our environments. So when should we use the portal? The portal is very useful when we want a single biz talk or a single virtual machine that's going to be isolated from everything else. If we want anything on its own virtual network, if we want anything to join and obey, any of that is going to be too, a little too complex from what the portal, uh, the portal is, I should, I'll say what the portal can deliver. The portal can do it. Uh, it's just going to take you a lot more time. You have to go in and manually join the computer to the domain. Um, you can do that stuff. Uh, more, more efficiently in PowerShell than using the REST APIs. So like I said, you'd want to use this for one-off scenarios. So if I want a virtual machine to test out uh, you know, a new, uh, new code packet, or I want to play around with making a REST call, I want to install uh, you know, a new software package and play around with it, I would use the portal, create it, and be done with it. Uh, so the pros to the using the portal, first off, is very simple. The cons, well, it's a little too simple uh, to do anything more than a single one-off isolated environment. Um, there's some properties that aren't settable using the portal. Uh, some of these things are only expo uh, exposed through the REST APIs and through PowerShell. Now, they've been getting a lot better at making more and more available through the portal. But again, this gets back to, well, if it's not 100% there, well, I might as well just learn the PowerShell or REST API approach instead of waiting for it to get added to the portal. Um, that was definitely the approach that, that I took. Um, and then the last point is it's not scriptable. So this isn't going to really be the best way to achieve my dream scenario. Uh, so we're going to take a few minutes and let's see how to build a virtual machine using the portal. Um, so you would simply log into your Windows Azure account. Now, if you have an MSDN subscription, you can get free uh, Windows Azure uh, money each month. They've switched to a pricing uh, dollars model or pounds model. Uh, so you get free every month, uh, anywhere between $50 and $150. Um, so you, if you have MSDN, you can come in here and play with this yourself, create your own virtual machines. Um, one of the things to point out is here you see it says stopped deallocated. So you continue to be charged for your virtual machine, whether you're using it or not, if it's running or if it's stopped. Only if it's stopped deallocated, and I think there may be one other state in there, stopped deallocated means you will not be billed for it anymore. Now, there's some ramifications related to external IP addresses, um, probably outside of anything we would care about. But you want to make sure you understand that if you go in to start menu and shut down, it's just going to stop it. You have to use the portal or, the, or REST API. You have to use a command to actually shut down <coughs> that virtual machine. Um, so these are all stopped. Deallocated, which means I'm not charged for them. Um, I still am going to be charged for the storage for those virtual machines. But in general, storage is cheap, much cheaper than actually running the virtual machine. Uh, so if we want to create a new virtual machine, we come in here to new, 
virtual machine, and we can look from uh, gallery. And here, this is where Microsoft has made a lot of investments. Uh, if you saw this presentation, I did something similar in TechEd uh, six, seven months ago. Um, the image library is much richer now than it was you know, even seven months ago. Uh, so we have all these pre-built images. You also have you know, my images here, which would show up. Here I have a custom image that I've created. And you would have disks that are available to be added. These would be disks that aren't already associated with another virtual machine. So they could come up here. I could create my own uh, OS disks if I wish. <coughs> Um, you can also upload your own disks. So I could have a virtual <coughs> machine running on premise, upload that disk, come back 48 hours later when the upload's finished, and you're going to see it here once, you, once you've added it as, as a disk. Uh, so we're going to look at this Tuck server. So I think I mentioned before, they used to have a 2013 uh, evaluation edition, uh, which had BizTalk and SQL on the same uh, image. Um, that is coming back as uh, BizTalk 2013 uh, evaluation, or. Uh, both, both MSDN and MSDN. Okay, as MSDN, uh, as an MSDN addition. Um, but until then, our two options are the enterprise and standard. Um, so we can actually select enterprise. And you see down here it says, you're selecting a disk that has special pricing, which is nice. I like that they include that now. And here I can give my virtual machine name, uh, virtual machine a name. And you can select the size. They've grown in the amount of sizes of virtual machines that they have. Um, if I was doing like a domain controller, I would use like a small virtual machine. If I'm using SQL, I would use something that's larger. If I'm doing something that I know I'm going to log in and actually be using it a lot, I tend to use large or even extra large. Um, you can change the sizes of the virtual machines after you've created them, but you have to do a reboot to get this new size to take effect. I'm just going to leave this at the default for now. Um, you have to select a unique or a new username to be the administrator. They no longer allow uh, just administrator. Uh, it used to be the default, but then they had people that were getting their accounts hacked. So now you have to supply the administrator uh, name. Okay, and now this screen has really grown in the past few months as well. So this is where I can configure my virtual machine. Um, you have the ability here to create a new cloud service, or I mentioned you can join an existing cloud service. Uh, you'd want to join an existing cloud service, like I said, for scalability. Um, when you join an existing cloud service, you get automatic round-robin balancing of your uh, publicly exposed endpoints. So if I'm hosting a, uh, a website over port HTTP or port 80, um, I can add multiple servers to my cloud service. It's going to automatically load balance round-robin across those for me. Um, in a BizTalk scenario, it probably doesn't add too much value. Um, there's other things it does to it, like ensure that they're on separate racks and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm going to leave the name the same. Here you can select whether I wanted to join a virtual network, I can join an affinity group, or I can simply join it to a region. If I join it to a region, I'm essentially saying it's going to be isolated all by itself. Um, I can join it to a virtual network if I want, but like I said before, I'm going to do all this more complex networking stuff via PowerShell or REST API. So for here, uh, the affinity group also is more related to performance. If things that are in the same affinity group, Azure will try to keep them closer together. So if I have my storage account and my virtual machine and the service all in the same affinity group, Azure, when they provision that, is going to try to keep them closer together for performance reasons. Um, so for here, it wouldn't matter if I add it to an affinity group necessarily, but I just want to add it to North Europe. And the other thing that, that is neat offer of this choice is your storage account details down here will change based on your selection up above. So if I selected something other than North Europe, like East US, where I probably have storage accounts, no, I uh, West US, here I have storage accounts already created in that region. So your virtual machine has to be in the same region as your storage account. because You can't go across data centers <coughs> and make that kind of connection. Uh, so I'm just going to select North Europe. And it's going to automatically create me a storage account. And then availability said I'm going to leave it to none. And I like here how it says that I've chosen a subscription that qualifies for MSDN benefits offer. If you were doing this on the Enterprise BizTalk edition and you didn't see that, uh, you'd want to use caution because you're going to get charged for that. Um, depending on the size, you know, it's several dollars an hour as compared to the base pricing, which is a few cents, uh, 20 cents or something. And I click Next. Uh, now I can install this VM agent, which, uh, to be honest, this is something new. Um, I haven't looked into what the VM agent does. Um, 
It, it allows you to get into your virtual machine if no, uh, you can't get into it any other way. Uh, I haven't looked at actually how to do that. Um, and here I can publicly expose different endpoints. And they, gen, uh, they generally tend to create uh, random public ports. So that way, again, if from a hacking perspective, you don't actually, if everything was on uh, the normal ports, uh, like you know 3389, it's a lot easier for people to keep hacking into that kind of stuff. Um, so they, uh, by default, you get remote PowerShell and you can get remote desktop. And then you would just click Next. And now it's actually gonna start uh, provisioning that virtual machine. So it's gonna use that image that you said to use. It's gonna create a copy of that image in your storage account and create that virtual machine for you. Uh, the process takes uh, five to 10 minutes. And then you would simply come back here and click the connect button. And it's gonna automatically prompt you to either download a remote desktop um, information or just run it and jump right into your virtual machine. Uh, any questions on this? Okay, so that's using the portal. So now that we saw how to do that, uh, this would be great for one-off virtual machines. But now let's look at uh, what happens when we want something that's a little more complex than that. So Microsoft just provided a REST API that uh, front ends almost all the features you, can, uh, you know about in Windows Azure. Uh, I think Steph John's gonna talk about uh, the BizTalk Services REST API and how to manage BizTalk through that. Uh, I've always focused on the APIs from a virtual machine perspective. So what the REST API does is allows programmatic access into Windows Azure. So PowerShell's great, it's a script, but if I want my code to actually access Windows Azure, though the REST API is probably a better fit for that. So it exposes more than the portal, as I've mentioned before. Um, various different things, uh, having virtual machines automatically join a domain when it's created. Um, and I'm sure there's more that are exposed through here that you can't do in the portal. Uh, the REST API uses authentication via certificates. So in order to use the REST API, you create a certificate or have a certificate locally, you upload it to your Windows Azure subscription, and then attach that certificate to your REST uh, call when you make that call. Um, the REST API very nicely supports async operations. So if I make a call to create a new virtual machine, I send in the XML body payload that creates the virtual machine, and I get back a token that is the operation ID of that create for the virtual machine. So I can now make another REST API call <coughs> to the operations API, pass in that token, and it'll tell me the status of that. So I can do these async operations, even kick off multiple async operations, and then find out the response <coughs> of, uh, of those using their tokens. Um, one of the other nice things about the API is, is it's versioned. So if I'm running against a specific version now, they release a new version tomorrow, I can choose when I want to upgrade to that new version, which is very beneficial. So when's the best time to use the REST API? Um, as I mentioned, when you want programmatic access to your Azure resources. So either through .NET or through BizTalk or through SharePoint, you can make these calls uh, into the REST API. Uh, a good scenario for this is when you want to have multiple users <coughs> building things out using the same subscription. So I have a corporate-wide subscription for Windows Azure. I can front that with REST API calls and have the users, multiple users, use that same subscription. Uh, it works great with the BizTalk REST adapter. I'm going to show you some of the sample code that I put together. Uh, it works as you would expect with the, the REST adapter. So we can use BizTalk to help model our uh, environments that we want created in Windows Azure. So some of the pros of using the REST API, uh, once understood, it's very easy to use. Uh, it takes a little bit of understanding, especially on the authentication side, to understand how to add the certificate and how to add your, uh, your uh, uh, XML bodies and the format that those need to be in. And it does easily support more than one subscription. You would just have to add that certificate to multiple subscriptions, and you pass in the uh, subscription ID, or you can have multiple certificates and you simply attach them at runtime based on the criteria that you've defined for that user. So some of the cons. Um, authentication is a lot like BizTalk. So once you have a certificate, so this is another reason when you have a multi-user build out, you might want to front that with something else rather than having each developer have that certificate. That when you have that certificate, it's all or nothing. You have access to everything in Windows Azure inside their subscription. So they could create 25 enterprise edition SQL VMs and just let it run. Uh, 
Um, and there's no way to know what individual user did that. Um, now they've made great progress on adding, you can have additional co-admins to subscriptions now, um, but I don't think it's to the level of knowing individual user, because they're still using that same certificate. Uh, and I think they support 10 certificates per subscription, if I remember right. So there's a limited number of certificates. If you had a large dev team, uh, you wouldn't want to be handing those out. Um, but I think that leaves the door wide open for Azure 360. So <laughs> nice management on top of this. It tells us what users do what. I hope Sarah Bond is listening. Um, no, I think it would be very beneficial. Um, the other problem I've ran into this, with this is the documentation is sometimes wrong. Um, good thing no Microsoft documentation people are here. Uh, the BizTalk documentation lady was already mad at me in November for making fun of her for being a documentist. Um, anyways, so the documentation which we rely on to get what the XML body needs to look like um, isn't always accurate. Uh, so essentially what I'm saying is there's a lot of trial and error to get this stuff to work. Um, so my overall vision of what the REST API can do is deliver this corporate-wide self-service <coughs> portal. So I can have one place that everyone in the company, 25,000 people, can log on and, select, and we can give them permission to what they want to create. They want to create a, you know, a new dev image that just has Visual Studio on it or something that has SQL or create their own domain. And now we can front that with this portal and then have that created for them using the, the uh, corporate uh, subscription that we have uh, created. <coughs> Um, another useful scenario I see is, uh, remember the virtual labs that they used to have for BizTalk a long time ago? So they created an environment for you, they gave it to you for an hour or two, and you could do these labs. Well, now we could actually spin up a virtual machine and say, here, you can have this for three hours, and then kill it three hours later when the person's done with that virtual machine. Um, with the REST APIs, you know, it's very easy to programmatically do that and have it kill itself a couple hours later. Okay, so let's take a look at the demo. So what I'm gonna show you here is a simple REST API tool that I've created um, to help us make these REST uh, API calls. And then I'll take a look at the BizTalk process that I've created that actually goes in and creates these virtual machines using the REST adapter. So here's the Windows Azure REST API helper. Um, this is available on biztalkgurus.com. I posted it about six months ago. Um, I'm gonna post a new update that has the new link to this. Um, this, uh, to be honest, uh, was the first time I made a REST uh, service call. So it was a huge learning experience to me. Um, I take a lot of pride in being a drag and drop developer. Um, <laughs> so REST API was definitely pushing the envelope. Um, and the funny thing is, is I made a comment years and years ago about being a drag and drop developer. And John Flanders, if anybody remembers him, like a, a legend in the BizTalk field 10 or 12 years ago, I'll still get random messages from him. You're still a drag and drop developer. So he, he remembered that. And he definitely was not a drag and drop developer. Um, so this is just a simple tool I put together here. Um, you can, once you configure things in the config file, um, you put the path to your certificate. This would be the certificate that you've uploaded to your subscription for your management. You put your path to that here. Um, the, when you look at the Windows Azure REST API documentation, it tells you step by step how to create your self-signed certificate and upload it, and it's pretty straightforward and accurate. Uh, then you put your subscription ID here, and then uh, location to the post bodies folder. So I have a bunch of sample messages that are out there, so you'd wanna update this to wherever you have this tool running. And then I would simply select from this pre-built list, I gave several different things in here that we can use um, automatically. Um, you could select, I want locations, and this is simply going to query Windows Azure and get back all the data center locations. Um, so this would be a good one to test uh, if you want to make sure your certificates are working, connectivity is all working. Um, it shows the HT, uh, key, HTTP response here, and if there's a body that's returned in that call, you're going to see it here in this window below. Um, you'll see something very similar to this tomorrow uh, related to BizTalk services, um, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, if it is an operation instance, so I do create VM, and to do the create VM, you have to configure your XML body, because XML body has your virtual machine details in it. Um, you would create that, and you do an HTTP uh, post to that, and it's gonna return you a token here in this operations response, and then it'll automatically set this to management, 
I guess it's not listed here, it'll automatically set it to the operations call. So you can do an async operation in this tool and then just kick, clip hitting make rest service call and it'll tell you the status of that request. Again, I think you'll see all this actually running against BizTalk services tomorrow. Um, so this will be this is out there now, and I'll post the link to my website so anybody that wants to play around with this uh, will be able to do that. Uh, so next, let's take a look at the self-service uh, code that I've created here for um, for working with using BizTalk to make these REST API calls. Um, as part of this, I determined that I needed a custom WCF behavior to kind of help me add the certificate as I needed to in the HTTP uh, headers and to make sure when I get a null response body, BizTalk orchestration, as we somebody mentioned earlier, doesn't like null response bodies coming back. No, it uh, does. <coughs> no, it does. Empty messages is supported now. Empty messages is supported now. <laughs> Anyways, I've handled that scenario. Um, <laughs> um, I still think inside the orchestration, when I try to evaluate that, it, the adapter might like it, but my orchestration is still probably not going to like it. Um, so I don't do much uh, exciting stuff in here. And again, I'll, post, I'll put all this code on there so you can peruse it at your own will. Um, but I'm, I do two things. So I look if it's a operation response and if it's accepted, and I look for that request ID. And I put that in a separate message. I grab that token value so I can return that to my orchestration if it's an async operation. And if it's a null operation, I create a special null response message. Again, I want my orchestration to know that it, it, it uh, was a null response, so something wasn't expected to come back. Um, and then before I send, uh, again, I'm writing to the event log, spamming it, <laughs> watch out. Uh, but this was custom WCF behavior, uh, very simple to, to create. It was much easier than I would have expected, just to help things out. Uh, then I created schemas for all of my operations that I want to operate against using the REST API. So I want to create a storage account. So this is the REST API body to create a storage account. I want to create you know, an affinity group. Uh, again, don't worry if you don't understand all these concepts. You, as developers, you wouldn't necessarily need to. You would just have one person build this portal, and then you just simply go to the portal and say, I want this, this, and this. And the orchestration, the people that are, you know, the, not experts, but almost experts in this would be able to, to do it the right way. And that's kind of the problem if you had everyone willy-nilly doing it. It's not everyone's going to do it what would be the right way. Um, so by creating these schemas, then I create maps that actually map into them so I can make my, you know, service account. So to, to start this off, it, it takes a make VM message, just the name of the VM, and then nothing else. So I use that name of the VM to seed the names of everything else, to seed the storage account, and et cetera, et cetera. So the orchestration looks like this, very straightforward. It's just going one at a time, um, creating my affinity group, uh, creating my storage account. I made it bigger so you can hopefully see it, but it's kind of making it not readable. Uh, and then here you can see like where I'm looping till success. So it's checking the status of these async <laughs> operation requests again and again. Um, and then at the end of the day, it actually comes in here and creates its virtual machine and that's gonna loop till it's successful. So, and my experience of working through this, I figured out what is async operations, what takes a while to create. Creating a storage account is one of them, so I have to wait for that to be done before I can move on and create the virtual machine. Um, so this is one example of how you could create uh, a self-service uh, portal on top of this to actually create these virtual machines. And you can scan, scan this out or scale this out to have full environment creation. I'm using the same approach. Uh, so I'm going to, running a little low on time, so let me jump into the PowerShell stuff. So this is really the cool stuff. The rest of the stuff has been like nice and have kind of stuff. Um, this is why I've invested hundreds of hours of time uh, to try to get the stuff to work. Uh, so the PowerShell commands, downloadable commandlets. Uh, based on PowerShell that do uh, cool things against Windows Azure. Uh, new features are added often. There was just a new release on 225 that created, um, obviously did something new than the old release. Uh, that was out two months ago. Um, but that was there. Uh, easily, easily understood by uh, anybody that knows PowerShell. So I invested some time, actually listened to a, a couple Pluralsight courses on PowerShell so I could kind of understand it. Um, but if you have infrastructure people, they're definitely going to understand your PowerShell scripts. 
Uh, third parties have created custom commands. There's a uh, company out there, they have really rich uh, commands specifically around virtual machines uh, on top of uh, the Azure stuff that really make this life easier, but then you have to pay money, so it's a, a purchased command, uh, command lens. Um, and the cool thing about the PowerShell is you can do remote PowerShell. So I can remote PowerShell into created virtual machines and run commands against them from my local desktop, which we're going to see in just a second. Uh, so when to use the PowerShell scripts, they do great for individual build outs. Uh, wouldn't it be good if I wanted to have 25 developers all working on my box, uh, obviously, to create uh, virtual machines. Uh, it works best when everybody has individual subscriptions, individual accounts, and are going to be responsible for creating their own environments and you know, virtual machines that way. Uh, some of the pros, obviously, universal adoption. PowerShell is very common, been around for a while. Um, to be honest, when I first started working with it, I was like, this was supposed to be so cool over the DOS prompt, and where's the coolness? Um, I guess I didn't understand it well enough. Um, again, I couldn't drag and drop anything, so all I had was I could tab and see different things. So it was a learning, uh, learning curve, definitely. Um, another positive is the PowerShell scripts are very easily customizable. So I can change them very easily, and we're going to see that again in a second. Uh, some of the cons, the initial setup and troubleshooting is a pain. You have to create a publishing file by hitting Azure on a certain URL, import the publishing file into your box. Uh, if I run something on this uh, laptop and then I go to my desktop, I have to redo that same thing again. If my subscription name changes, I have to do that same thing again. Um, again, it's probably outlying things that not everybody's going to hit. Uh, but definitely initially, initially setting it up and getting it to work uh, takes some work. Uh, frequent releases definitely cause breaking in things, and poor documentation on new changes. I have no idea what changed on 225. I have no idea how to find out what changed on 225, um, but something changed. Obviously, they have a new, new release, um, and also the online documentation doesn't seem to keep up with the new releases that come out. Um, either that or Google isn't getting me the current page. Maybe I should try Bing. Maybe it would work. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's challenging to find out when it says I'm missing a parameter and the documentation says that I'm, that I'm doing it right. Uh, most of the time you need to run these scripts as an administrator. You need to right click open PowerShell you know, as administrator to, uh, to get them to work. So this leaves us to BizTalk running on infrastructure as a service. Uh, so I've created two core sets of scripts. I have my single server install and my domain install. Uh, the single server scripts were working the best, currently broken, uh, was using the BizTalk 2013 evaluation image that has been sunsetted for various reasons. Um, once the new image is available, I'll update the script. I'll make sure I do a blog post to make sure that's out there. Um, this gives you full end-to-end -end setup and configuration of your BizTalk environment. I take care of everything by you just supplying simply your subscription name. I think that's the only variable you have to change and a globally unique name for your virtual machine. And it'll actually configure that environment. So you log in, and you're ready to go. You can deploy code right in to your BizTalk server. Um, it's a little hacky. Um, I, I, that's, I, I think that's OK. Um, I wasn't able to get any type of unattended BizTalk install to work. So the downside of this is I'm still, if I wanted to programmatically fire this off and programmatically create the configured <coughs> BizTalk environment, I still can't do it. I have to have that interactive user session. I need to remote desktop into that box to run BizTalk configuration. Um, even with the new BizTalk provisioning tool, I still have to log into one box to kick that off. Um, haven't figured out a viable way around it. So what I do is put a bunch of cool stuff on the server for you, create a scheduled task, and programmatically call remote desktop in a little window that's one by one so that it can run all its stuff and then it closes itself again. So, you wouldn't really see it if you weren't paying attention. So if you don't notice it and it works and you're excited, then that's cool. Um, this script end to end, including the configuration stuff, it took me about 50 hours to create. Um, so not as much time put it, went into this. Uh, now the cool script is the full domain uh, build out. Um, the thing to note in here, it does use the enterprise edition of SQL and BizTalk. So if you're running the script and not using your MSDN account, you're going to be charged you know, a high per hour rate for those, uh, those images. So keep that in mind. Uh, what this script does is it, it first off creates a domain controller. It adds the BizTalk domain users and groups to that domain controller. It creates your SQL server. It creates two BizTalk environments. It tries to configure your BizTalk environment automatically. 
and then it fails miserably. <laughs> but then, if you just delete two databases and run it again, it works beautifully. So, since i am got a PowerShell script, I'm just gonna script deleting those two databases. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so three days from now, this is gonna be beautiful. Uh, and I have spent a lot of time on this and it's still hacky and I wish it was better, but um, I'll continue to involve the script over time. But the key takeaway here is you don't need to necessarily use this for BizTalk. You can use this for any kind of domain creation. Um, and what you see in here, so let's, let's just jump into the script. Uh, so I broke this up. These are, these are the scripts here. Um, the first thing I should point out is always create a remove script. So if you do something in here and you want to try to remove it, you just run the remove script. It should take care of everything. Um, I also created a save money and a spend money script. So remember I talked about you want to shut down your virtual machines via PowerShell because if you do it in start, shut down, it doesn't always deallocate it. So I created scripts for that. You just run uh, save money. It's going to turn everything off. Spend money. It's going to turn it back on. Um, but the key to everything here is this variables file. So as long as you keep the same variables file for your same execution, everything's going to work. You're removing it and save money, spend money, all those scripts will work. And that's simply because it uses this base name. It's essentially the key that it uses for everything. So like the storage account is, you know, HMT 010-storage uh, account. You know, so that's the key file that's used for everything. Uh, then I broke everything down into four separate scripts here. Um, I'm probably going to create a fifth for this ultra hacky configuration piece because hopefully I can do that better later, remove that script. Um, but the first one here is going to actually do some of our core environment setup. It's going to create our affinity groups. It's going to create our storage accounts. It's going to actually create our virtual network. Um, before I do any of that, I check to make sure it doesn't exist and then goes out and pr provisions those artifacts. Um, when I get into things like the network config and I get into the, the BizTalk configs, I have uh, took kind of the same approach that the BizTalk deployment framework used, where I kind of have a core network config file that then I do find and replaces of different variable names in there to make it unique to your specific environment. So you can create whatever host names you want, you can create whatever virtual machines you want, or whatever names you want, whatever networks you want, and it's going to find and replace these token files that Microsoft needs to create those environments automatically for you. Uh, so I think that makes it as simple as possible for anybody who wants to run these scripts. Uh, the next script is going to actually create the domain controller. It actually creates the virtual machine, and then it comes in and does some cool stuff. So now I'm going to actually do remote PowerShell into that virtual machine. And that remote PowerShell is going to install Windows features and actually make that a domain <coughs> controller. And then once it's a domain controller, I'm going to log back in to, as remote PowerShell, and I'm going to automatically create our BizTalk groups, our BizTalk users, and add the users to the correct groups. So that way, when I fire everything up, my domain controller is all set up. I've hated to create domain controllers in the past. It's taken a lot of time. This does it in about 12 minutes. Uh, once the domain controller is done, I'm going to create my servers. Come in here, I create SQL, and I create two BizTalk servers. I won't spend a lot of time looking at that. The key piece is when we get into the configuration section. So to do the configuration piece, I'm going to remote PowerShell into SQL. I'm going to do some work on the SQL server. I have to add the BizTalk user. So I, again, Tor, don't listen. I add like the BizTalk user as like the domain user as an admin to SQL because I want, I'm just trying to get the scripts to work. And this is just for dev. Um, so I go a little overboard. So like you can see here, I'm using uh, PowerShell to, to add that user, uh, adding them at the logon uh, as a Windows user. So uh, sysadmin, <coughs> that's not too much rights. Um, so that's in there. Um, also do cool things like turn off the firewall. Uh, you can do all this uh, via remote PowerShell. So I turn off the firewalls because I'm on an internal network. I want everybody to be able to talk to each other. Um, then on the second BizTalk box, I download a bunch of helper files. So I use these helper files to do various different things. Um, right now, these are creating a scheduled task that run when the user logs in. And then it runs PowerShell commands on that box locally. Because I've tried to do it via remote PowerShell, and it just doesn't work. Uh, I'm going to go back and try again, um, and I am working with you know, the, the product group to find a good solution to make these scripts not as hacky. Um, the end result will still be the same, but um, a little more in line with the best practices. 
Uh, so I download a bunch of files from storage accounts, and then here you can actually, my coolest one is I install Classic Shell. Everybody uses Classic Shell, right? I can't, I can't live without the start button on Windows 2013 or 12, so I installed that automatically for myself. Um, and then at the end down here, uh, while the process runs, I'm, here's where I'm updating the BizTalk config file with our hosts and computer names that we specified, SQL Server, <coughs> all that gets done for you. And then down here, I'm gonna loop over, I've turned it off uh, because I'm doing a slightly different process, but I actually write out a done file when configuration on the first <coughs> box is done so that I know when I can clean up everything and end my remote desktop session. So that's what this process is doing. And then at the end, I say you're all done. Um, and all this is keyed off of this variables file here, which people can peruse as they wish. Um, there's only three things you need to update. Um, that's the base name and subscription name and your setup directory locally. Well, this has to obviously exist. Uh, so let's uh, talk about some scenarios. Ready now, dev test environments. We can get up and running with this. Um, Working on getting environment creation, I really see this being useful for nightly builds. We want to automatically run our unit tests. We can create this programmatically. That'd be great. Um, depending on scenarios, uh, sometimes running production or enterprise edition biz talks will make sense. Uh, if we want something geolocated, something to run in Japan, for example, or we want to use the new biz talk 2013 features like REST API, uh, a REST adapter, or uh, SharePoint Online adapter, we can do that now. Uh, and I think those are good uses of Windows Azure. Uh, review, uh, this is everything we talked about. Azure is simple to use. Uh, scripting allows for easy environment creation that can be repeatable. And uh, BizTalk plays really nice with Windows Azure uh, infrastructure as a service. Uh, questions, don't forget, email me, me at biztalkguru.com. Uh, these scripts I'm gonna post on my website. Now that website is biztalkgurus.com, so don't get confused. Um, and you'll see them on there in a few days.